Falls back in the Jared the Boss Man show with Jimmy Oakman of the Brooklyn Nets, Long Island Nets is player development and video coordinator. Jimmy, how are you doing, brother? Good to talk to you, man. Oh, I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you having me on. Now, Jimmy, are you have a great career in basketball. You wrote two books. You worked your way up, man. Now you're in the NBA and the G League level. Now, so talk to me, Jimmy. When did you first get the urge to want to get be in basketball beyond just playing and want to coach in it and do getting the video and coaching and scouting? So how did you get into his role, man? Do you want to say, hey, this is my career path going forward? Yeah, I always knew I wanted to be involved in sports in some way, shape, or form. I never thought I was going to be good enough to play pro in anything. I was probably a better baseball player than anything. And um, going into college, I didn't go to play sports. I went to UMass purposefully. Uh, I grew up during the Marcus Camby era, so UMass was all the rage back then. I figured I'm going to go there, and they had a great sports management program. And I got hooked up with the basketball team there and started doing some things. And uh, I knew quickly, like, hey, this is what I want to do. I'm always, you know, I was out playing pickup, you know, four or five hours a day. And I'm like, man, if I can make a career out of this and still have that competition side of me, there's nothing better than that. Most definitely. And uh, and also when Cal was there, so he was a great coach and John Cal, Cal, Cal Perry there. So did he, how much has he helped you in your career for us, teach, giving you the little nuggets here and there on how to, you know, look, look at some schemes and understand defense, offensives, and also breaking down tape because being a video coordinator is so key to breaking down the tape for the coach, getting them reports ready for scouting reports and shooting rounds ready for guys so they know who they're going to get to hear every night there. He, he was there before me. He, so he was there when I was growing up, but Derek Kellogg became the head coach at UMass when I okay. was there. Kellogg played for him. So uh, he came from Memphis when Cal was there and they had to run. So a lot was probably, you know, <laughs> very, very similar. <laughs> so I, I loved it, like getting to see him take over the program and uh, from scratch and being an alum, it was, you know, there's more passion being an alum for your school and being at the coach there. So was something for me that I was like, man, this is tremendous, you know, dive into that. And I learned a lot from everybody on staff there. Yeah, Derek, Kill, that's my guy. He coaches at LIU Brooklyn. Or well, still LIU Brooklyn with something else. They're the Sharks now, ain't they? The Sharks. Those those yeah, white colors now. <laughs> yeah, they went from the black birds or whatever to, like, the blue and yellow. And uh, so they combined everything. But I he's doing a great job there. Yes, indeed. Now, Jimmy, for you, man, uh, so – I mean, let's talk to you about as a video coordinator, man. What do you think about that in that role you're in, and how do you attack it, knowing know what players want to see, what what coaches want to see? So, how do you kind of divvy up the film? So, because every guy different way what what, what what they want to see on film. So, how do you divvy up for certain assistant coaches who have certain certain scouts, for head coach, and players? How's it all work? Yeah, for me, like, I view my role as just being the right-hand man to the head coach. Um, whatever he needs, like, I'm going to be there for. I'm trying to be proactive. So if there's something that comes up, like, you know, we can buy some time because I'm already ahead of the game a little bit. The assistants, I kind of do the groundwork early and try to get them up to speed with video if they don't know the system and kind of how we do things. Um, and then, like, I have my own scouts as well, making sure that whatever help that they might need with their own, I'm going to be there for them as well. Uh, but mainly, like, I try to look at it as, you know, Let's take as much off the head coach's plate as possible. How can we condense things? What's going to make him understand what we're trying to do in the least amount of time? Because he has so much on his plate as it is. And how far ahead do you look for is the schedule? I know the NBA games come at you fast. So in, in G League is where they come at you fast. So how far ahead do you start looking at film of other teams getting those advanced scouts from, from your area scouts, regional scouts, to say, hey, we got to kind of – put the groundwork here now we know we got to see them in a week or two but here here's what go what we got so far so we so in the g league like unfortunately we don't have the advanced scouts so we rely on what brooklyn was doing a lot of the time and, and trying to get the intel from those guys because a lot of time it matches up but we kind of before the season began we divvied up the scouting the scouts kind of to spread them out a little bit so we gave ourselves ample time kind of looking ahead so you know, if I got the first game, another coach got the second, someone else got the third, fourth, and then hopefully if, like, a full rotation goes by before it's my end again so I can have, you know, I can watch five games or so to get caught up to what I want to show the guys. Now, there was a time, like, twice this year, I had back-to-back -back scouts. We played, like, Friday, Saturday, and I had both games. Um, I kind of did that purposefully because I knew the video load I'd be able to handle. I didn't want anyone else to kind of deal with that headache. And, and so everybody was kind of spread out a little bit. I think that was the best way to kind of handle it. And uh, I think it works really well. You just got to be really prepared. And, you know, time management at this level is paramount to anything. 
Most definitely, Jimmy. I feel like, you know, it's so intensive because, you know, to the to naked eye, this just look like a, a pick and roll, but you don't know if you're there two time on it or they got some on the strong side, on the strong side. So you, it's a little bit more to it what people can see unless, you, unless you're in the game like you and I are. And so it's like, you know, it's not just that basic. Coach, they want to see all the drop coverages when they, how they hedge in the pick and roll, get in the gaps and slots there. So it's like, hey, <laughs> it's more to it just what we see on TV. So, like, where is it set exactly in the floor? What hand? Who's in the corner? Which side is it on? How much time is it? What wrinkles do they have? Is it an ATO? It's going to, like like you said, it looks like something, but it's not. And uh, you, you got to be prepared. You don't want your head coach looking down at you at the bench, like, why didn't you know what's cut? Like, why? we never seen that or we didn't talk about it. So, you, you've got to know, hopefully, all the answers before the questions are even asked. Now, part of the play development piece, Jimmy, is getting guys to understand what they're watching on the film. So, how much work do you sit with the with guys on the Long Island Nets or the up of the big team of the Nets to teaching them how to look at the young guys, how to look at film, understand the film, and correlate to the game plan that we go up and shoot around and in meetings here and in the film session? Yeah. I think that's the biggest key between going from the college level to the pro world is how much ownership the individual needs to take on themselves. Um, they're not going to be so much as coddled like they I think they do in college a little bit, but the guys that we've had in our organization from that I've been my experience in, especially in the G League, have, have been unbelievable as far as wanting the information. And our assistants here and a great, like, one-on-one with the player, like, let's sit down, let's watch some film, let's talk about it. And, you know, as the season goes along, those younger guys, like the first-year guys, they learn so much so quickly. And they're, they're the ones starting to ask questions, hey, can you send me stuff on this? Can you uh, – so you develop a bond and relationship with them and hopefully, like, Nowadays, like so much stuff pops up on Twitter, like I see something, I'll shoot it to the guy, like, hey, like, what do you think about this? Or, you know, you've seen Dame Lillard come off the ball screen, like, this, like we can do this too, like, you know, or Patty Mills manipulates this, he's good at this, can we, let's work on that. Um, so, so it's not just watching themselves, I'm trying to mimic what they could become in the NBA. Most definitely, because, you know, the eyes of Scott don't lie. No, that film does not lie, man. You can learn so much from that film, and you can just learn so much basketball because, you know, if you look at that film and those still shots, you can kind of pick up on what guys do, their dominant hands. Because I feel like the Scott report and the film go hand in hand. A lot of times young men don't quite understand that coming into the league that, hey, the Scott report in the film is kind of the report, it's kind of showing you that on paper, what you're watching on film here. And so you know where to shade the guy, not to shade the guy to who to help on, who not to help on. You know, let this guy take it, content, don't run it. So, like it's so much, but that Scott report is that verification on the film right there, Jimmy. And our guys got to learn it, learn it early for sure. Oh, that, that's a big piece of the player development is understanding the Scott report and being able to take what the coaches are trying to give to you and apply it. That's just as much of a skill as shooting or whatever. Like, can you keep a guy from going to his right hand? Like, can you get him into the ball screen and force him to his weak hand or? Those things are just as important in that, you know, it doesn't matter what the box score says. If you get burnt every time defensively because you didn't follow the Scotty report, you're never going to make it. That's exactly. And, 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 you know, Jimmy, what I love what I love about the league is that, you know, a lot of guys, you know, they love to come in scores, But defensively, where you really got to get on the ball, I feel like a lot of guys don't understand the NBA defenses when they get in the league because they in college play a lot of zones and mix and matches. Now, the Raptors play a lot of zone, which is rare. So does the Mavericks and Miami, of course. But most teams are going to play you man-to-man, and you got to really be, defend those slots and gaps where they're going to either build a wall for you and say, hey – get you in rotation. So I think defense in the NBA, Jimmy, in G League is where guys really have to develop the most, honestly, in my opinion. No question. No question. I think you see that a lot um, with guys that are coming in, either leave early for the draft and end up in the G League or whatever the case might be. When you're scouting teams, you, you can kind of see, especially early on, them being late for rotations, them not understanding the help, the NBA rules, or overhelping or – you know, teams in college, their helpline, they're standing under the basket. But the NBA, like, you can't leave guys in the corner. So, like, they got to understand those things that uh, – little nuances of the rules that, you know, we're not going to leave that. Even if he's a 35% shooter, 34 whatever, and from that corner, you better stay on him. And weak side, like, you better hold your spot and be ready to rotate. Uh, and you see it. And you see the gradual growth as the year goes along. So, you know, like, teams and players are starting to understand what it should look like. Especially, you know, what I love is by – I talked about this a lot of different coaches is that, you know, the drop coverage for, on, on the pick and roll. That is really like, you know, the thing that these days, hey, some teams are going to 
hedge it and follow it with the five. Some of us on drop it and force it into the paint and you give up three pointer, of course. But like that, to me, the NBA new thing is that that drop coverage, Jimmy, and a lot of guys don't understand it. I had it when it was coming to the league, but that's what they do. It's a drop coverage, not rather than then, you know, or fourth quarter is going to happen. It's going to be isolation. going to run either one, five, one, four, pick and roll. If you're switching it one through four, the five man's on you. It's like, <laughs> so it's like, you got to be able to defend the guards coming downhill at you as a five or four man in the NBA now these days. That's just a skill to be developed as well when you come to the league and G League as well. Yeah, I think that's huge. And you're always trying to bait that long, too, you know, like off the dribble, especially if you can get guys to sucker into that, you know, 20-foot pull-up two-pointer. That's what you want. And, like, as you said, bigs now, like, you're seeing them get smaller and smaller. It's not so much because they're shooting, I think. I think it's because they need to be doing a better job defensively and being able to stay in front of those quick guards. Well, definitely. And that's why I love the game is becoming like a position of basketball, Jimmy. It's like a five-man can be six foot eight or six foot nine now. You know, the Rockets, they're a little bit too small, but, hey, the, the idea is there because you want to be able to switch one through five because when you got guys put you downhill, you got to be able to move your feet and defend. And you got to have a, a mobile four or five minute can defend those one, 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 through, one through threes and an explosive four that can come downhill at you. Yeah, I mean, everybody would love to have those six, eight, 230-pound guys can defend one through five. I, I don't think anybody would shy away from wanting that. <laughs> so, yeah. you become really versatile. Yes, indeed. And so, Jimmy, when you are showing young men uh, who they can become in the G League, so how they self accept that when they want to be developed into who they who they want to be, get a get a contract on 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 the NBA team, a guaranteed deal, where they on on the bench there, one one to fifteen. So, how do you get a young man to buy in and say, "Hey, I see these skills in you." We can develop you get here if, if you put in the work and do what we're trying to show you. How do you get a young man to buy into that idea when they've been the man in college or overseas and to come into the G League there? Yeah, I think that's the biggest question that you kind of run into. And I th someone mentioned it last night on a Zoom I was talking, but they said, like, obviously you're not going to show them LeBron, right? Because physically you're never going to match up to him. So you got to be realistic about it. And I think the guys that I've been able to work with, one player in particular, like he, he's a locked, like knockdown shooter good with the ball, like makes great decisions, plays hard defensively and uh, undersized shooter. But like, you know, my thought is, can we get you to be like the next Bryn Forbes? Can you be a Patty Mills type? Can you be those guys that you're a secondary ball handler, great shooter, competes defensively, understands the defense? So for him, it, it was, it made all the sense in the world, right? Like the guys in the G League uh, that, that do make it, understand that they're going to have a role in the NBA. They're not going to be the elites of the elite. And so when you get that, you hopefully you can talk with them through it. And like Matt Thomas, how did Matt Thomas get a career in the NBA after being overseas? And he does everything in the sky room for. He doesn't make mistakes. He's obviously a lights out shooter, obviously. Like <laughs> that's why he's there. But he can do all the other things at an above average level and he competes hard. And that's what I think I try to convey to the guys that you can never sacrifice your effort and intensity at which you do things. And if you have an elite skill, we got to get that even better to make the next level. And the Nets did a great job over the past few years of developing talent. I mean, the young guys the Nets have is like one of the characters with you guys and your staff because, hey, I saw your guys make improvements, you know, and that's what I'm hoping for the Atlanta Hawks here in Atlanta that will happen for our young men over here at the Hawks. But the Nets, I saw from what the program you all built, it's like your young men on your team are developing, and now you got to the point where you could sign on Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving now because of the development of your young talent and how that matches with those two superstars is going to be great to see, see here going forward. Yeah, I think player development can really drive your culture of what you want of your program, no matter where you're, whether it's high school, AAU, college. If you take, like, player development as, like, your backbone of everything, I think your culture will fall in line. I think your players are going to get better, so your team's going to be better. And obviously that's going to translate to wins. I think once you get everybody buying into the same page of, hey, let's, you know, everyone needs to get better. And if you see improvements, it's only going to help. And Jimmy, for us, play development pieces. So when you're trying to develop a, a plan for a guy, what all goes into whether you want to make him a shooter, make him be more of a pick and pop guy, be a flare guy, rim roll guy. And defensively, how you develop, develop him in defensively? I know a lot of his offensive development that you see, but how you also develop on the defensive the floor for drills and make the you guys get developed defensively? Because that's, you know, if you stop somebody from scoring, you can never keep a job in the league and score as well. Yeah, I think that's, it's very specific to each guy. Um, and, and you're trying to develop, trying to figure out who he was as a player, what he can become, what he can tap into, what he's going to look like if he, when he physically matures, 
Um, some guys come from, you know, elite programs where they've had strength conditioning coaches. And then you're looking at guys maybe that didn't have a great program when they came into it. So you're thinking maybe there's something to be tapped into there. Uh, so, you're, so you're always trying to figure out that role. Uh, and, and I think the G League as a whole and talking to a lot of guys that I know, it's not just so much getting them to be the best player for your organization. You're also trying to think, what's going to help this guy earn the most money, whether it's with you and he can make the protein, like the parent club, or you can get him over to a Euro league, Euro league team and make more money over there. So like we're like, you're talking about no mid range shots. Like a lot of the NBA people talking about, well, if the big is never going to be a stretch five, they can shoot it outside. But you know, if he plays in Europe, maybe he needs to make that 15 footer. Like, so we still need to work on that to an extent. Maybe it's not what we do, but it's keeping his interests, you know, in the back of our minds, like what's going to help him. Um, so, so it can, and different teams do it differently. Like a lot of teams will focus more on what that player can become, not just for them. Uh, some people more, it's like a hundred percent, just, Hey, your role with us is going to be this and we can help you make more money overseas too, if that's the case. And it goes, there's no right or wrong way, but I think you need to find out what they do well early on and then kind of let them grow into that while you're slowly trying to add things defensively. Um, like you kind of said, I think versatility in the G league is really, really big. I think oh, definitely. You can show that you can defend, you know, two through four NBA teams are going to pay more attention. Now, if you can only defend a point guard in the G league and you're five eleven, I mean, you have to be honest with yourself. Like how many five eleven point guards in the NBA can only defend one position and make it. It's hard and it can be done, but you know, if you're six five and you know, you got a strong build and you're strong enough to battle some four men, you're probably going to be able to carve out a niche a little bit easier. So to that point, I think, I think you're starting to see more G League teams switch one through four for sure, and, but mostly a lot of them are trying to switch one through five just to see, can we ha does this guy have those skills? Um, and you're always trying to work on staying in front of the ball. Like, can you play, you know, two on two, three on three, stuff like that that are helping them? You know, we're not just playing guards versus guards. It's guards versus wings versus bigs, and we're switching. So you better, you know, front the post, be tough, be physical, and you're always trying to work on different things for those guys. How much do you all experiment with guys for us in, in game stories? Because you don't really want you can do work on it all day long. But how much? How how, how do you some do you go in the game so that we was experiment with this scheme and see if this guy can do this scheme and kind of feature guys certain games to kind of see what the guy can do? Because it's a developmental league. You want to win games, of course, but you kind of tinker and see what a guy can do. Give him some different situations. Say, hey, okay, maybe you can see if he can do this tonight. It's for us, we kind of evaluate him that way. I think. I don't think we probably change the scheme too much, but we change their position. I think. I, I think you, what you have to do is if a guy came from the NBA and he's like he's a four man in the NBA, well, we might put him out there at the five, like and just see what it looks like. You know what I mean? Like, hey, he's not really comfortable out there, but let's try it out. Or a guy comes down, he's always been a pretty good shooter and okay with the ball. He's played like the two to three. Let's give him the ball. Let's see what it looks like. You know, maybe that's going to help his career. Maybe we can like find some diamond in the rough skill that he didn't really have before or guys that have always been like he's a knockdown shooter let's put him in the corner well hey let's give him the ball like maybe maybe it works out maybe it doesn't but um you know maybe a guy's like you think he's a liability defensively but he always knows the right spots well let's play him against a bigger guy and force him to compete a little bit harder and, and see what you got I think you're always trying to roll the dice um in this league like there's games that we've had only seven guys on our roster that can play so it's like you better start playing you know you were initially a two but today you're a four Yes. You were three, four, and you're six, four. Well, you got to defend the fives, and I don't know what to tell you. you. I mean, we got no one else on the bench that can do it. But so it, it forces you to kind of, you know, think that way where you got to be, all right, we got our three guys that can play the five, we got our three guys that can play the four. Well, you know, we need six guys that know the five position just because whatever happens, uh, rosters happen, and, you know, you got to be able to adjust. I think that's the beauty of the G League. Most definitely. I love I love it because, you know, I love watching the GG League games on, on my phone and stream because seeing guys, you know, try to compete for a job, Jimmy, is just so amazing because these guys really care about the game, love the game because they're, they're competing for their lives and livelihoods. So those young men have the idea to want to just be like, hey, look, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I, I want to get to that the Nets roster. I want to get to the Hawks roster, not just be in the G League my whole life. You know, I want to make it for real, for real. Yes. I think that's the beauty behind it. Like we just said, like that's why I loved when I coached Division Three before is because those guys, they're not getting a scholarship. They're not probably going to play professionally, but 
they love the game. So they're there to compete. The G League is much like that. Like they're there to make this a livelihood now. Like they're earning a paycheck. Like they know, hey, if I miss the bus, I miss a flight, like I could be cut. Like my it could end tomorrow. So you're getting them at their best. And when you have that, it makes the experience so much better. That's why I love it too. Like um, obviously everyone aspires to be in the NBA, but I love the G League. Like I tell everybody I know, it's second to none. You got that right. And, and Jimmy, let me ask you this, man. Uh, so, for it, is, is when you're developing the guys, do you ever go over a place with guys? Do you ever draw a place for them to make them try to show you the X knows themselves, kind of make them see if they really understand the play? Have them draw it for you on the board, kind of give you the what, – what does this play mean to you? What are you trying to accomplish with this play? You're trying to get a three-man a layup or get an open three on the weak side here? Do you make the guys kind of get, get, in that, get in that nitty-gritty with you, kind of draw it up themselves before you see what they really see? Yeah, great question. And I love X and O's, so I really try to take pride in it, especially with the guys I work with. Um, I show them where their shot's going to be from and kind of talk them through it. Like, this is what it should be like. If they defend it this way, this is going to be the option. This is what we're going to see. And as time went along this year, uh, we ran a lot of ATOs for our shooter, like our top shooter on our team. And I was responsible for his development. And I would meet with our head coach before every game, and we're going over ATOs. Like, and then I know, hey, we're running this play, first play. It's going to be for him. So in pregame warm-up, we're repping that play. And so he's already getting in his mind, like, I'm coming at this angle, this speed. This is where the ball's coming from. Because how many times you run up, you got a great play, you run up there, the timing's messed up, the guy doesn't get the ball where he's supposed to, he doesn't know the angle he's supposed to take. But for me, it's just like, if he can feel confident in doing it, even if it's a bad pass, it's off rhythm, he knows what it should be. And uh, I think it worked out well. I think it ease their mind a little bit going to the first game, the first play of the game at least. And uh, he, I mean, he's a really smart player, so it's not really my doing, but he, uh, he understood the game at a much higher level for a first year guy. It was impressive. Yeah, you know what I love about that as well. And a lot of time after timeouts in the NBA, they want, they want to zone it up now. New things is when they want to zone it up because they know you have a good man in play. So, yeah. so he, they want to zone it up now. <laughs> I know the, the Blazers are good for doing zoning up to that. The Celtics are as well. Enough field teams will wrap the zone up to after timeout plays. And, you know, I'm like, you got a good player, John. <laughs> they come out in a 2 3 or one 3 one zone yes. <laughs> and throw you off. I don't blame. Yeah, we're not we're not dealing with this today. Like, I, let's just do something. That one that we might not even work on it. Let's go zone one. I don't even want to see this thing. Like, I, I agree. <laughs> it, it, it's funny to me, man. Cause like I said, you know, for me, man, watching the game is a little different for me. I'm like, I'm, I'm, look, I'm looking at I'm looking at everything. I'm, I'm just watching. I'm looking. I'm looking at the strategy. I'm not even looking at. What you looking at? I'm looking at who's come off, the, who's the backside people are doing a pin down, who's flailing on the back end, who's uh using the post to draw a double and see if we can get some on the on the other uh, weak side there, you know, who's helping off the uh, help strong side. You know, what I love about the Celtics and the Heat is, is they'll help off the strong side three, which is very rare. Yeah. I, I wouldn't. I was just doing it, but hey, they do it very well. They get they usually get back and give a hard contest as well to it. So I give them credit for doing that. I wouldn't personally do it, but I give them credit for doing it. <laughs> no, they, they, in the Raptors too, like all all those three teams, and there's something to it, right? Hey, they were three of the top four teams in the East, and um, you know, like you not want to give that, shot, but you also don't want to give a drive up either. So like, there's a give and take, and those guys. Like, to their credit, those guys on all those teams compete so hard. I think they compete more than probably anybody in the league. So uh, I get why they can do it in their long. You build and you recruit to that. But, man, it's a tricky balance. You know, you give up a direct lot, direct pass at that open three. So I always tell people, Jimmy, it's uh, NBA is about – the slots and the gaps there, it, right, right there, that's what it's all about. How you can fill slots and gaps and build that wall. That's what it's mainly about, like the Milwaukee Bucks. Because now, I know Kenny was up the Nets, so I, I know it from the Hawks being in Atlanta, with the, the defense is build a wall and give up three pointers. I know, I know who it is. Protect the paint. So it's like, I've seen it love him, up close to personal for when Bud was here in Atlanta. So it's like, I know what the defense is. Like, oh, uh, yeah. They're like, it's about that slots and gaps there. Defend the paint, pack the paint. We'll let you make – if you can make 100, 25 threes and beat us, hey, tip, tip and cap. But if you can't, we got you covered, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's the game, right? Like, you, you're trying to take away the easiest shots and take away the better players and getting open ones. And if you can do that no matter what your scheme is, I think you're going to win more than not. If you can just get guys to buy into, like, going back to the Skyner report, right? Like, who's the shooters? 
who's the drivers, who can you help off, who can you out of, and you're trying to play the numbers as best you can, but trying to keep it simple at the same time. And I'll tell young Kyle Cox all the time, so look here, look here. There is in the NBA, guys are going to miss assignments. It happens. Don't take it personal. Just look at the film, correct it, try to be better next time. Because when you hear the moment, yes, you might panic and, oh, oh man, I helped off Steph Curry. What's wrong with me? I should have let, no, stay with him, let Draymond get you a three. You know, it's like, it's like hey, it happens. You get hit, hit the moment, you're competitive. You don't want to, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah. just take the miss assignment. Watch the film. Be better. Be better next time. Right. Exactly. Like, and you got to know they're human too. They're not trying to make mistakes. I think that's where a lot of coaches kind of. Like, I don't want to say a lot of coaches, but I think a lot of old school coaches from the college world, like, you know, the players aren't trying to make a mistake. Like, they're trying to do the right thing. They don't want to give up an open shot, but it had like, it, you could. You don't know what they're thinking. Like, you know, they could have thought there was should have been the gap, and he wasn't. He leaves a shooter for half a second, and it's in his face, but. You know, I think when the players' intentions are right, you can't be mad. Like, you know, next play. Like we As coaches, we got to move on, too. And I think, Jimmy, sometimes coaches overreact. So, I say, for instance, that you go from a man to a zone. They give up and make one open shot, they got a zone real fast. Maybe just they just made a shot. You know, you can't overreact to a, a made shot or – greatness or if a guy makes a tough three you can't you go crazy about it because you defend it right this is better offense to better defense right there it's better offense he just, just, just go with that and be and be okay be okay live with that and live with that result if he does it all that long fine if he doesn't we win right i think that's a great point i think um watching the miami and the celtics series uh, their first game the heat threw zone at him what i think it was like 20 possessions or so but the Celtics scored at an above point per possession. And you would look at that and be like, oh, they were pretty good against it. But when you watched it, they just made some tough shots. And so in thinking about it, like if someone just looked at the stats, they'd be like, oh, maybe they don't come back to the zone game two. They did, and the zone was unbelievable game two for Miami. And, and so, like, people want to just look at numbers, and that's easy. The numbers aren't going to lie, but it doesn't tell the story either. So I think, like, as coaches, like, you got to walk, like, all right, take the numbers, let's look at the film and see what it looks like, and then make adjustments from there. And, Jimmy, I don't know how you feel about this, but I hate plus-minus stat. That stat, to me, is, is very misleading because you may, they may well have a big run while you're in the game, but you probably packed the game. You know, you know they may have a big run. Or, you know, if you play a lot and they make runs while you're in the game, your plus-minus is going to be bad. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't tell the real story. You could have been making every rotation. You could have been making every shot you did was designed for you, and it just didn't work out because you was on court when they was – us was going crazy, crazy as well. Uh, so it really don't tell us full story, like you said, of what really went on on the court that night. No, especially like one game, so many people get wrapped up. Like they'll look at the halftime, like, oh, he was a, you know, minus nine. It's like, all right, well, you know, <laughs> what did it look like when he was out there, right? Like, did they bank in the three? Was the end of the shot clock, they throw something up that went in? Was it a bad foul call? Did he come in the game and they were at the free throw line? It's already two points. Like, you don't know how they're looking. So, like you said, like that's something you don't want to overreact to. Now, over the course of like 50 games, like all right, you you got something there. But it, for one game, a lot of people look at it and they'll be like, Tyler Hero had a tough one last night, I think plus minus wise. But you know that's really not an indictment just on him, right? There's four of the guys in the court with him, so um, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. But one game and people overreact, and I'm with you. That's just. <laughs> cool. and Jimmy, being in the media now, like you know, seeing guys ask questions about Mike. You have no clue about basketball. <laughs> Some question I hear asked of coaches, I cringe because you know I I I, I know the game, so y'all don't know that y'all just asking the question off off a piece of paper. You could even t- you you can't even ask this coach about the the backside pin down. You can't even ask him about two time on a, a drop coverage. You can't even ask him. You just look at well, he didn't make shots tonight, or tell us about his. Ask ask about the actual game. Impress the coach. Don't. Look at a paper and ask a little, little dumb question. I hate that about my colleagues in the media, Jimmy. I hate it, man. It sucks. Oh. They don't, don't know the game. I, I love when you hear, like, the detailed questions about, like, kind of what you're saying, right? Like, it's not like, all right, well, you guys are missing shots. Well, like, hey, when you guys were running floppy two and you guys were getting open looks and, you know, why didn't you keep going back to that play? You know what I mean? Or, like, take it a step further. Be like, you were, you know, you got great looks running this action. Uh, shots weren't falling. Why didn't you go back to it? You know? And, or something to that extent. And I think a lot of times, like, people in the media, like, get mad at Bill Belichick. Well, when you ask him a detailed question, he responds with a detailed answer. And, you know, 
I, I think he really respects those questions that you're talking about. And I, I agree with it. Not that I, I would ever be as short as he is sometimes, but I, I respect it because uh, he wants you to think about it critically. And I think there's a lot to be said about that. Man, Jimmy, I'm impressed with Romans, man, I cringe sometimes, man. I, <laughs> I cringe, buddy. I'm <laughs> like, ooh, this is just so yeah. media guy. Because, see, my, my degree is not in, in media, Jimmy. It's in business. <laughs> so my degree is not in media. So <laughs> I, I didn't go to journalism school to learn how to do this. I needed to learn this one as being who I am. But <laughs> but it works, it works better that way. Like, I'm much better knowing, like, I could never be, I don't think I could ever be on TV, but I know the game well enough that I could talk as like a coach might see it, but I might not be the most well-versed, like just grammatically on TV. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like, see, I'm, I'm an athlete, so this don't, like, what? I'm looking like, do you, yeah. <laughs> do you, do you, do you even know what a pin down is? Do you even right. know, do you know what a flex cut is or a rim roll? Can you, oh, he was dunking the ball. That's called a rim roll. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Do you know what a, a flare or pop up is or a pop out? Or can you talk about a triple screen? Or can you do anything? You know? That stuff's important because I think that's where you get like really the analysis and getting the coach thinking. I think even even when you ask players, I think I seen the Sean Watson last year break down the last like, amount of plays of a game and someone asked him a question and everybody was like, wow, this is the insight we want. Well, ask those type of questions that's going to lead to those type of answers and you'll, and you'll get it. Like, I would love to sit down and like and ask LeBron questions about the game in depth because you know how he processes the game is set at such a high level, and, and you want to hear that. Uh, at least I do. Hey Jimmy, I had to tell somebody on my and my colleagues. I said, I asked, you know what the strong side is or the no, <laughs> the side the ball's on. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a little> <laughs> the, the weak side. The ball, the, the where the ball is not. <laughs> you know what the rotation is? No, they is, they, that's when they rotate to the other player who's open. You know what help side is? <laughs> you know, I say, I say if you see them on the on the block looking at the strong side, they're in the help side. They're looking to see where they need to rotate to. I I try to break it. This man been in the business twenty years, Jimmy. <laughs> His questions are I'll talk about it or tell us about. <laughs> so so yeah man i cringe buddy <laughs> I cringe. So I, pre- I appreciate good questions as much as anybody does that's for sure i love talking about it so tell us about you got two books man tell us about your books man and what's about you to write, write these books that you wrote man and i that you can get online right in 2015 you can get them online people so Jim, tell us about your books buddy yeah. It was just something I did, honestly, to supplement income when I was coaching Division Three and moving on in the business, just because for those that don't know, you don't make much money in this business when you're first starting out. It took, you know, eight years of coaching before I made a full-time salary. So, you know, I'm studying things and I thought, well, you know, why not share this information if I'm coming across it? And someone said like, hey, we'll pay you, you know, before like selling it as eBooks before and you can get a cut from it and, and just get your name out there as well as put out the good material. And so I started doing my own thing and I'm like, all right, let's study the pack line. And so I studied the pack line and put something together. And like, people were like, we, we paid money for this. So it, it was never anything I wanted to do initially to make money. But when people wanted it and I was like, well, you know, you're not making a whole lot coaching division three and making the move to division one in a sports staff role. And, and so I did it. And, you know, it was a way for me to connect with other, co- other coaches too and share the game. And um, I'm trying to advise younger guys now in the business to do the same thing, both to learn, but then, Hey, you know, if you, if you're not in the business, don't have a job, but you can take a volunteer high school job, hey, put something together and sell it. See if you can make some money, a few bucks on the side to help you grow your career. And I think that's, you know, the best way to kind of get involved in this business. And people say like, oh, I can't make it financially. But find a way. It's out there. Like, you can make it happen. Well, definitely. I can say it was well as a way, Jimmy, because, you know, basketball is never going anywhere. And, you know, a lot of guys are starting to age out. So there are opportunities now coming because, let's be honest, a lot, of the, a lot of guys are starting to age out. A lot of the legends are going to be leaving the game here real soon. So get it in the pipeline now. That's why I love what Adam Gordon does with rising coaches and Brian Burton, those guys, because they're putting young coaches on the forefront because they need a pipeline. 
and, and you got to know somebody to get a job in the business. But if you put something out there, people know who you are, recognize who you are, they network, network with other guys, hey, they might get a job in there. They, they go, you're in. They go, you're in. You're an assistant coach. They be one, two, three, three assistant coach. But you're in there. So you can keep working in your craft and getting better, and then you move up like you did. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about. Like, you need to show people, like, it's not good enough anymore just to know somebody. Like, you got to show somebody that you know the game or you have something to back up your name. It's kind of like your resume, but it's a portfolio of work, right? Like, you can just say, I was at school of some blue blood. I, I did this. I was here. I was here. I was here. But if you show, like, hey, this is, you know, every end of game situation I've categorized for the last three years or whatever, and you're able to showcase the work you put together, I think that goes further than just saying, like, these are the stops I made along the way. And, uh, you know, that's my best advice to young guys now. Most definitely, Jimmy. I feel like, you know, man, like, you know, this business is so fun. I, I love coaching. For me, I have most things I remember from my, I from my coaches. Coaches impact young men's lives so much because you're with these us guys closely on the court, spending time competing, but also just talking about life. And I feel like coaches impact you more than anybody in the world other than your parents because of how close you are because of a common goal, common interest, and it breaks down that wall of where you trust each other and you learn and you grow. And the coach helps you become a better man, a better husband, and a better father going forward throughout your life. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing, especially developing relationships at this level and just trying to convey to them, like, hey, like, we're in this – with you like we're trying to help you go someplace that you didn't think you can get to and if we can help you along that journey like the guys that weren't with us this past year that we had two years ago I'm still in touch with those guys because I want to see them reach their dreams and help their family and you know be able to support them by this game and uh like Taj McCall wasn't with us last year in Long Island but I'm still in contact with him I want to see him you know I want to see him score 40 points in the NBA game hopefully not against us in Brooklyn like the Brooklyn Nets but like, you know, I want to see him do the best he can possibly do in this game and see him grow both as a person and as a player. Most definitely, like Todd, I said, he's with our college sports Skyhawks here. And how was it, Jimmy, seeing that they know to have us have a team in Atlanta now, the Skyhawks? Now, how was it coming down there to the Gateway Center seeing those guys play against you guys this year before everything got shut down? Yeah, you know, that's a beautiful place. Um, they did a great job with it. That's perfect size for the G League. It's, you know, the whole design, I love being down there. It's cool to see the G League expanding uh, and to see those guys on the team. Uh, you know, they came from Erie and Taj down there and seeing them. And, uh, you know, he he came ready to compete. So I, I love seeing him in person. And uh, it's such a great place, you know. Uh, the basketball history down in Atlanta is, you know, shoot up there with any city in this country. And uh, for them to have a G League team that's close by and not in Erie, you know, that's only going to help Atlanta in the long run. And you think the G League will eventually expand and get more guys on the rosters and maybe the NBA expands the roster, but where they be, like really, really you can send more guys down. Hopefully expand the roster, we can send more guys down and have guys in the pipeline because, you know, having a pipeline of young men to call up if somebody's hurt for a game and send them back down and be good. Have, you have seven, you have two, two eight players, but maybe a few more spots for that so you can have guys to develop in your system and, and maybe help you down the road and so you're not having to always go scour with a waiver wire to find a guy somebody gets hurt all the time. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope it gets to that point. I think you'll see that there's going to be more G League teams than the NBA team probably the next few years, especially with Mexico talking about having a team and uh, like Grand Rapids, it seems like they're always going to have a team, even though Northern Arizona is getting rid of theirs. I think at some point you'll see Denver and Portland get a team. We have the G League, that select team that's out there as well. So you're going to be around 30 teams coming soon, and there's going to be more that follow suit. So, you know, I think it makes sense, especially obviously with COVID. We've seen the NBA expand the rosters a little bit to allow for the hardship, extend the waiver. Uh, but you're going to need those situations. I, I think it only helps the product. Uh, especially if, you know, you're playing three games in four days in the NBA and some guy gets dinged up, you don't want him to turn into a long-term injury. So if you already have a guy on your roster that can be there, that's only going to help. Like, it's, it doesn't hurt anything, right? Like, so I think it's going to come a long ways. And I think, you know, the sooner you can expand it to a true minor league system, I think, I think that's where we really take off. What are your thoughts on having the, what the guys can bypass college basketball and then coming in G League for a year and prepare, prepare them? So I think it's a good idea because everybody's not made up for college basketball. Yeah, some guys a little bit, they just don't want to do it. They don't want to take a risk and not get any money, you know. So how do you think about having that, that situation there where young men go to G League and for a year there for the goals of the draft and develop and learn a little bit there and hopefully put their draft stock there? 
I think it's twofold. I think the players should be able to do it. I think they've always should have been, should have been able to. I don't know the exact reason when they took it away or why the reasoning behind it. Um, you know, once they're an adult and graduate high school, they should be able to, you know, play professionally if they're good enough to make money. And I think that transition, if they go right to the G League, I think the G League needs to be prepared for it. I think a lot of coaches uh, might have only coached pros before and not really coached 18-year-old kids. I, I think there's going to be a big learning curve for coaches to have, like, you're basically their parent now, right? Like, they should be in college for, you know, three, four years. Are you ready to handle – them on the road they've never you know besides AAU and that stuff they've never stayed in a hotel well you know well now you're on the road you give them a big check and they get a per diem and they're out and they can do their own thing well who's who's watching over them right like you got to make sure you have a stable culture of veterans around them to help them learn the way um but at the same time like you're going to treat them the same too like hey you missed a bus you can get fined or however teams kind of handle that stuff and uh you're teaching the accountability really quickly but I think if the player's dream is to play in the NBA, the G League is by far better player development wise than anything you'll see in college. It's not even close. And so if that's the goal, great. But I think college is probably way ahead of where the G League can be as far as developing them as people off the court and the long term that can, it can benefit from it. Now I know there's a program in place with off the court player development that's, that's here. And I think the G League is doing a great job in the NBA to be part of the NBA world. But uh, I think – NBA organizations need to hire accordingly to make sure that they have guys that can coach and develop them off the floor as well. So that's going to be a big piece of it. In my opinion. And Jimmy, how was off season being with COVID here for the G League team? Because you know things stopped in March there. So how was that been? And what does it look going ahead trying to make sure you get you guys who might be on the roster next year? You know, keeping them guys in you know, strength conditioning wise, developing wise, when they're not with you guys because of COVID right now. It's it's hard, um, but. You know, I know a lot of the guys have reached out to our strength coach and trying to stay in shape and do their own things. Some guys have more access to things that, you know, others don't. Uh, I try to stay in touch with a few of them pretty periodically and just, you know, some basketball stuff for sure, but just checking in on. I'm like, see, what are you watching on Netflix? What video games are you playing? That type of stuff. Just just anything to get in your ear, talk some hoops a little bit. Like, who do you got in the playoffs? Who you got tonight? Like, uh, hey, I saw this play. I was thinking about you. And so you can't really beat them on the floor. A lot of them getting back in the gym now pretty – consistently and you see like all the stuff on Instagram so you're trying to follow it and see what they're doing and what are you working on and things like that and unfortunately like we're not really with them um, the way the contracts work too and some of the guys like signed overseas already to other places so trying to follow them as much as possible too and you know some guys in Russia some guys in Australia and them getting ready for their seasons and just trying to stay in touch as best you can and you know like just hoping for the best for them that's really what it's about. Man, Jim, it's been fun, brother. I'm glad, glad to have you on, man. I knew this would be fun to have you on. I told you it's gonna be fun, man. I told you. To, I told you it's gonna be good, man. Man, you're the best. This is great. Hey, we gotta do this again real soon. And we come to College Park, man. Let me know, man. We gotta get to get together, man, for sure. Oh, I need some good food spots. I'm always trying to find some good food wherever I go. So. Hey, it's a weird spot, but trust me, six six feet under. It's as the name is terrible, but it's a great, it's a, it's a great seafood spot. It's a great spot, man. The name is just horrible, man. That's all. Hey, I'm down for it. When we get down to Atlanta, I'll be sure to make a trip there, and I'll definitely give you a shout. That's for sure. Hey, Tim Lizzie's got some some good uh, tacos. Pick any three tacos you mm. want, man. Man, look, I got spots for you today, Jimmy. Spots for days, man. <laughs> yeah, you gotta get a sponsorship for there. That, that's what you need right now. You give them a plug, so hey, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Hey, Jimmy, this has been fun, brother. Hey, be safe, man. We we'll talk real soon, man. I just getting down the road, brother. Awesome, appreciate your time. Thanks, man. Hey, it's time for the Jimmy Oakman here in the Boss Man Show, people.